Welcome to Moments in Time with Lucien Byfield. This time we look at the history of the Austrian Grand Prix. There was a time the Austrian Grand Prix was one of those tracks to fear, with the famous rink curve producing incredible g-forces and high speeds, a true man's track, as it would have been described in the swashbuckling 80s. But whilst retaining sections of the original Osterreich ring, it is a much safer or emasculated circuit today. The Austrian Grand Prix started in the 60s with a non-championship race in an airfield and it was from 1970 onwards that the race was held at the Osterreich Ring in Zeltweg. The race left the calendar after 1987 to return again in 1997 as the A1 Ring but a heavily cropped and safer version of its former self. Sadly, after only seven years it was gone again, unlikely to return and the track lay in a sorry state of disrepair for years. That is, until Red Bull bought it and gave it a can or two of their energy drink to bring it up to modern standards to become part of the championship again in 2014. No prizes for guessing what Red Bull called the circuit. Oh, can you imagine the meetings they had to come up with that name? <laughs> the track, almost in a bowl amongst the picturesque Styrian mountains, is visually stunning and has long been my favourite Formula One circuit both for its undulations, elevations and breathtaking views. When they had grid girls, oh wow, there is nothing quite like the beauty and glamour of an Austrian lady in a dirndl dress, the style of which the peasants from the Alps traditionally wore. Now certain motorsport series frown on the so-called exploitation of grid girls these days, and when a girl is wearing dental floss for a bikini, I would tend to agree, but when beauty and tradition are entwined, it is nothing less than class. There you go Barry, don't shout out to a mate. My first memories of the Austrian Grand Prix are from 1997. Even though I got into Formula 1 in the late 80s, I didn't watch all the races, and from 88 the Austrian Grand Prix was off the calendar. What caught my attention in the 97 race was a certain camera angle introduced just before the Remus corner, giving the TV viewer a sense of the speed and elevation that the cars have to negotiate, as it was taken from a low down angle following the cars right up to the right hand turn. Over the years, we were to see some remarkable races, incredible crashes and typical controversy that only Formula One can produce. So let us get cracking with some fun facts first. Local fauna has played its part over the years, from the 87 crash that Stefan Johansson had colliding with a deer when driving for McLaren in a practice session. Lucky to be alive, not the deer, Stefan was a little beat up, but he still raced on the Sunday. Speaking of a deer, oh dear, look up Juan Montoya's oh dear comment when he was warned in 2001 about a deer being on the circuit. A play of words led to radio communications explaining to Juan exactly what type of an animal a deer was, a horse with horns. It is hilarious and Juan's laugh is so infectious, you have gotta look this one up. Austria has given us a few notable first-time winners, Vittorio Brambilla, more on him later, Elio De Angelis in a corker of a finish edging out Keke Rosberg, to Aussie Alan Jones, where the national anthem could not be found, so they played happy birthday for him instead of the Australian national anthem. Oh, how the professionalism was to change in Formula One. But Austria is also famous for hosting the one and only Formula One race won by a Penske racing car. John Waddy Watson was to win in 76, and in doing so, had to honour a promise he made that he would shave off the beard he was so well known for. Many versions of the story do the rounds, but Waddy confirms himself that the next morning even Roger Penske did not recognise him when he came in for breakfast. Austria has seen some controversy over the years, notably the 2001 and 2002 race fixing episodes where Ferrari were to ask Rubens Barrichello to move over late in both races to help Michael Schumacher in the championship when he did not need it. Rubens made it very obvious and whilst giving up second place in 2001 was hard, giving up a win in 2002 right on the line was even harder. The crowd booed and Michael had no idea what he had done. We saw that many times in his career, but he embarrassingly lifted Rubens up to the top step on the podium, which caused even more aggro with the officials to add to the team orders issue that was a breach at the time. Oh, Ferrari. There was a time when they were often in trouble, although they would subsequently get away with it every time, particularly in the Michael Schumacher era. 
Now, Sebastian Vettel has not inherited this mantle. A classic no-brainer move happened in 1999 when David Coulthard took out Mika Hakkinen, his own teammate, in a clumsy half-hearted attempt at taking and not taking the lead at the start of the race. Adrian knew his words still ring in my head, David, what did you do? Given that Michael Schumacher was out with a broken leg and the McLaren boys needed to seize the opportunity to win as much as possible while he was away, DC gave the race to Irvine in the Ferrari and suddenly Irvine was the man fighting for the title and he nearly won it too. Mika, third on the podium, looked disgusted, though to his credit he always behaved with dignity. Takuma Sato in the Jordan was completely torpedoed by an out of control Nick Heidfeld in 2002. This was truly frightening and had the crash been an inch or so different, Taku would probably have been killed. But the 2017 Indy 500 winner was to walk away. A similar accident happened in 97 with Irvine and Alacy, with the Benetton leaping high after banging wheels with the Ferrari. There are many more, but the start line pile up involving Michael Schumacher in 2000 was incredible, especially considering how Shuey made sure his injured car got going again, limping to the center of the track, then stalling. <coughs> yeah, we all knew what he was doing, trying to bring out a red flag, but there were only red faces for him and Ferrari that day. Oh, and quickly, look up the three starts in 1987. It's too much to explain here. It ended well for Mansell, winning in his 100th Formula One race. Now, every driver wants to win their home race, and Austrian drivers rarely fared well in their own backyard. Gerhard Berger was never to get the results he deserved. Posthumous world champ Jochen Rindt had a couple of tries, but Niki Lauda did manage to win in 1984. Shout out to Catherine Garland, who wanted me to mention 2016. In recent times, Nico Rosberg has shone in Austria, often outpacing Lewis Hamilton, and after a cracker race in 2016, he was looking to score a hat-trick of wins there, but suffering late race brake issues, let it be noted, Nico too has had many issues in his career, including 2016. Anyway, he stuffed up by making a terribly dodgy attempt to keep the lead on the last lap. This lame and deliberate block on Hamilton, something Hamilton would have done on the last lap too, by the way, was to gift the win to Lewis. Strangely, Bottas has often outpaced Lewis there too, but it was Max Verstappen giving a win to Red Bull on their own track in 2018. My money is on him again for this race. Maybe Honda will finally be winners again. Back to Vittorio Brambilla, or the Monza Gorilla as he was affectionately known. It was 1975 and the bullish Italian driver, known for his machismo and wet weather driving skills, was to notch up his one and only career win for March. But in doing so, he spun and crashed over the finish line, further enhancing his aggressive yet accident prone reputation, and this win would make him famous or infamous. Well, that's it for Moments in Time. I'm Lucian Byfield. Bye for now.